Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the engineering side of data. We're going to be talking about the Open Data Lake House today. And I have a special guest to help me do that. His name is Alex Merced. Uh, thanks for coming on, Alex. And please introduce yourself to the viewers and listeners. Thanks for having me. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Alex Merced. I'm a developer advocate uh, with Dremio. And basically, I spend all my days living, breathing uh, the data lake house and technologies around the data lake house and just being really excited about this, like, really exciting trend because it really can, it opens up a lot of doors and answers a lot of questions uh, when it comes to just sort of building a, a better tech stack. Nice. Um, all right, let's uh, get into the questions. Um, this data lake house, um, we've had some preliminary discussions uh, it's a relatively new concept on the scene, um, a lot of hype behind it. Uh, please help us understand it. Give us an overview of what the, the data lake house concept is. Bottom line, it's the, the data lake house itself is all about just sort of kind of getting the best of all worlds. So essentially we have our data lakes, which are act as like our dumping grounds for all our structured and unstructured data. And we like our data lakes because oftentimes, whether we're using object storage or a Hadoop cluster, it's much more affordable to kind of store all that data. The problem is oftentimes trying to run analytics on the data lake in the past hasn't necessarily been as performant or as easy um, as we'd like. So in that case, we generally end up using data warehouses. The problem with data warehouses is um, they can be kind of expensive and especially um, you only end up loading a subset of your data. So all your data doesn't have access to the data warehouse pools. You're paying this huge bill. Um, you're duplicating your data because you're, you're going from the data lake to the data warehouse, but you get the benefit of the experience. The data lake house gives you sort of this in, the way I would think about it is like, you know, this this uh, data in a box in a sense where you don't have to think about what's going on under the hood. You just have this box, you put your data in it. It's going to perform well. It's going to be really easy to use. So you get this nice experience. So we have this experience that we really enjoy and this performance that we really enjoy in the data warehouse, but we have this sort of cost and sort of centrality of, of data location and lack of copies that we really enjoy in data lake. And the idea behind sort of the, the data lake house dream is how can you capture both of those benefits? So there's definitely different been different approaches on how to achieve this sort of data lake house, uh, basically giving more data warehouse feel to your data lake um, or giving, uh, well, there's different approaches, but um, basically I can sort of uh, have come from the school where it's like, if you want this, like one of some of the problems that came with data warehouses became because they are closed in the sense that once your data is in there, you don't know what formats they're stored in, what's kind of going on under the hood. So you're kind of locked in. So what's really important, if you want to maintain the benefit of the cost in data lakes, then you're really going to want openness because that's going to allow you to have one access to a lot of tools because your data is accessible by the different tools, but also creates that sort of competitive atmosphere that's going to keep costs down instead of you just being sort of locked into the space. So I'm always concerned with, you know, as we build this ability to do data warehouse like things on the data lake, that we keep it open so that way we always avoid that and, and, and we don't you avoid getting back where we started. Nice. Now going back to a comparison to data warehousing, does does a data lake house typically have um, modeling, like data modeling that resembles a data warehouse? Um, like meaning that a data warehouse typically you'll find a dimensional star schema type of approach. Is that something you'll see in a lake house or is it typically more of a single table type of a design? Um, it just, it really depends on what you're trying to do and what tools you're using. So that's the thing about the data lake house. It can, it can really look any way you want and it's going to depend heavily on sort of the, the tools that you use. Um, so one way to think about it is it's a, basically a data warehouse deconstructed. So far as having like, you could have a single table design um, if that's all you really need. But if you need sort of multi-table joins and whatnot, there's different tools. So for example, like with, for example, with like Dremio, um, I mean, you have like this layer that you could add um, that kind of adds an interface between several different data sources and several different data consumers. But then there's other approaches, like let's say like with Snowflakes with their data warehouse, where they're a data warehouse, but they're trying to add like data lake house features in the sense that, hey, we'll give you access to some of your data in the data lake house with their external tables feature. Um, so there's different approaches to sort okay. of like, how do you create that up? what does the abstraction over your data lake data look like? Um, <clears throat> and then again, you have like 
then you have like Databricks, which has like this whole sort of basically a data warehouse just built on top of your data lake storage. So it just depends on sort of how how much you really want to be bought into one vendor and how open you want to be. Um, but you can generally achieve any kind of architecture you want. Gotcha. A lot of flexibility. And being mm -hmm. the fact that it's a relatively new concept, I'm sure things are still getting figured out. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, as patterns emerge, we might see maybe a more dominant approach. Um, and we talked about, you talked about this open concept a little bit during that intro question, but could you elaborate on that? Why does it, why does open matter in the lake house in your opinion? Uh, it matters for, it matters a great deal. I mean, and the thing is, first of all, just like define what I mean by open. Cause a lot of times when people say open, they think you just mean open source. So it's like, yeah, the code's available and you and it's accessible. And that's good. You do want to be able to have visibility of the code, but it's also openness and participation. And that's participation in the development, but also in the governance, which I think is a part that people don't focus on enough in the sense that it's not just sort of one institution that has control over like the governance and supervision and the direction of the project. Because our open source project where you have lots of people contributing, um, you can have visibility of the code, but oftentimes like the actual decisions of which pull requests get merged in, which features are going to be added are oftentimes controlled by a, a small few. So this is where like projects like Apache Iceberg really excel where it has a really, there's not really any company you can say like, that's the company that controls what I, how the direction of the iceberg project. Like it originated Netflix, but you have companies like Apple, um, Tencent and uh, Stripe and LinkedIn who will all contribute to it quite a bit and all have a lot of say on, on not just as developers, but being members of the PMC and things like that. Um, while there's other projects sometimes, again, you may have a lot of developers from other companies, but then one, when you did have visibility on who were on, was on like sort of the managing committee, it was all the same company. And nowadays you may not even have visibility uh, at all of who's sort of in that sort of committee that makes those decisions, um, which gives you concern about sort of, and the reason why that matters is because if you are a company who's building sort of tools for the data lake house, um, a benefit with Apache Iceberg, you know that, hey, if I'm going to invest my time in developing Apache Iceberg and developing support for Apache Iceberg, I'm on the same footing with all the other vendors. Okay, and that creates like an even equal playing field that everyone's going to feel comfortable playing around. When that's not the case, what's going to happen is over time, a lot of vendors are going to pull out because they're going to feel like they don't have the same sort of fair chance of competing on that playground. And then eventually you will end up with that sort of vendor lock-in in the long run because you only have one or two vendors left behind at, at so much time. Yeah, that's, um, that's an excellent point. It just goes to show you that not all open source is equal. Um, you may have a project that has permissive licensing, maybe MIT or Apache licensing, and mm -hmm. that seems like, hey, this is great. I can use this how I want and with no restrictions. But like you said, who's steering it? Do I, is there an opportunity that, um, or I guess uh, more of a concern that the direction may be more suited for one vendor versus the community, right? So I'm definitely something to, to keep in mind. I agree. It's just that it, it um, at the end of the day, like the openness, one of the big, especially particularly with the data lake house, because one of the big uh, value adds is the idea of, of a lower cost versus a data warehouse. So if you don't have that sort of diverse vendor ecosystem, then that really big benefit will dissipate. And then the other big benefit would be the access to different tools, which would also dissipate. So again, if those basically, if you don't have that even playing field, the, the whole value proposition for data lake house will over time disappear. Agreed. Why don't we get into some of these tools that kind of support this open data lake concept. Uh, first up is Apache Arrow. This is something that um, has intrigued me uh, for a while now. Um, I know a little bit about its origins and maybe a little bit about its purpose, but I'd love for you to kind of get into the details and, and tell us about it. God, the Apache Arrow project is absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, at, at its most core sort of simple straight to the point idea is just that we can do things better when it comes to analytics when our data is columnar i mean this is sort of the inside of using things like pandas and not um using uh parquet files that if we do things in a columnar way it's going to be more performant when we're running analytical type workloads but apache the problem is that it's not just about sort of how you represent the data in a file like a parquet file but that data has to be loaded 
into a computer's memory. And the question is, is it still columnar once it's in memory? And many tools would just kind of come up with their own columnar in-memory way of representing the data. But the problem is, is as different tools work with each other, if they're not using the same playbook, then there's still serialization. I still have to convert from this columnar style to this columnar style. And there's a penalty for that. There's a cost in more compute having to run, uh, which means lower queries, higher compute costs, so forth. So the idea is that if we could all work for the same sort of columnar format, you're not having to convert between these different formats as often. You're going to get faster performance. Um, and then two, um, lower cost, because again, less compute, less cost. Um, so that's where really like Apache Arrow comes in and gives you this standard in-memory way of representing data that any tool can then embrace and use and has many libraries across many different languages for you to work with this format. And now when I have if I'm working with data on my computer and then I send it over to a particular database that supports Apache Arrow, or I send it to a data tool that supports Apache Arrow, um, there's also going to be speed because there's also the data transport aspect of Apache Arrow. So there's the in-memory format, but the other big bottleneck was uh, with JDBC, ODBC, because JDBC, ODBC was sort of built with row-based data in mind um, because that was the way of things were for the longest time, no matter what kind of workload it was. So what happened is that even if I had my data in a Parquet file, I loaded it up into my tool, um, and it was loaded into Arrow in memory, that was much faster. But then when I sent that data over to some other location, well, JDBC would then serialize that into an, a row-based format, and then it would have to be re-serialized back into a columnar format on the other end, and you had that penalty there. So they came up with Apache Arrow Flight, which kind of figured out, okay, hey, here's, how, here's a standard for how we can transport data between two tools, without having to reserialize, deserialize, which gives you huge performance gains, especially at much larger sizes. So it's like a video I put out on YouTube uh, under, 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 it's under the Dremio YouTube account, but it shows like basically what I did is we ran a script with PyArrow um, and ran a huge, basic queried some data, some, uh, like I think it was like 100 million records or something like that. Um, and then we uh, did the same thing with JDBC and we did it actually different uh, record counts, but the lower record counts, like the benefit was there, but not like as pronounced. But as you kept increasing the records, that savings of the deserialization, uh, the serialization, really, really compounded and really meant for like huge stark differences in how fast you were able to receive that data. Um, and so that's, and then again, those are just two aspects of the Apache Arrow project. One more that I'll mention is uh, Apache Arrow Gandiva, which was a, a contribution to the Apache Arrow project from Dremio. And what this does is really cool. It, it takes um, it basically you you have different like sort of arrow processes because arrow was a lot of that was developed in Java. So, but the problem is like you know there's a penalty to when you're 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 processing stuff over the JVM versus if you were able to process it as native code. So what it does it can recognize different Apache arrow processes and say okay hey well this we don't need to run this every time through the JVM we can compile this to native code and save us that time every time that particular process runs up and you end up building this sort of uh, cache of just sort of pre-compiled uh, processes that you can really accelerate queries by. And it, it really helps un accelerate arrow-based uh, workloads um, beyond just the, you know, the reduction in serialization, deserialization from the in-memory format and the arrow flight standard data transport format. Nice. Yeah, that serialization and deserialization, that can be a real killer. Um, so I can definitely see the appeal there. Now, how has the, you mentioned that Arrow is, you know, an attempt at a standard, right? How has the mm -hmm. adoption been with with the tools around the ecosystem, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been expanding. Um, I don't have, like, a exhaustive list at the top of my head. I know there's a lot more that I've adopted it than are currently in my head. Um, but I know, like, it's, it's a lot of uh, Python libraries, I think, including, like, Pandas have really kind of added uh, aspects of Arrow un underneath the hood. Um, and then I, I mean, Dremio definitely uses it top to bottom. I think there's other engines and other data tools uh, that have like arrow endpoints. I think a lot of databases have added arrow endpoints as, a, as an option. Um, and the cool thing about that is that one of the, the things that makes it difficult to adopt because you may have like these ten different databases that have arrow endpoints, so you can make an arrow request to arrow flight. The problem is like, oh, I have to use this different way of doing things. I'm just used to using JDBC or ODBC. I'm used to sort of like that workflow. Um, what was recently released was an ODBC JDBC, uh, specifically a, a JDBC driver that basically it's a JDBC driver, but it applies the arrow framework. 
So essentially, you don't have to do anything different. You can just use it the way you've been using JDBC, but you're getting the benefits of connecting via Arrow to any to any database that has that supports Arrow and also supports connections to JDBC. So it's basically instead of having to install a different nice. driver every time you use a different database, you just use one driver to to use them all. Nice. Well, here's to hoping that uh, adoption continues, and because um, that seems like a pretty um, pretty pivotal piece of tech that it'd be nice to have in place across the industry. Interesting. Uh, how about let's move on to another Apache project, Iceberg. Tell us about Iceberg and its role in the lake house. Apache Iceberg, man. I spend, <laughs> I spend a lot of time thinking a lot about Apache Iceberg, and it's a really cool project. So first, let's just kind of like mention like what it is. It's a table format. And, you know, there's a lot of people in and around data that, you know, we take a lot of things for granted, particularly tables. Like when I use a database and I create a table in Postgres, like it just works. Yay. If I load data into like a data warehouse and I have a table and I run queries on it, we take it for granted that there's all this stuff going on under the hood as far as how the data is actually stored on disk. How does, how is it optimized? How does it tracked? Um, so one of that is kind of figuring out so what happens on our data lake, I may have a data set that is represented by 10,000 Parquet files. And basically a table format allows me to sit there and have some sort of abstraction that a query engine can use and say, okay, I don't need to know about the 10,000 files. I just need to know that this table exists. And there's this metadata layer that tells me, okay, these 10,000 files are the table. That's the data set. And gives me the gives me additional metadata so I can plan my scan of those files efficiently as possible. Um, and that's where you end up with like these table formats, particularly uh, Apache Iceberg, Apache Hoodie, and, and Delta Lake, uh, which are sort of the, the three that are vying for that sort of heart of the data lake house. Apache Iceberg has been sort of particularly exciting for me for a variety of different reasons. One being its departure from the old standard. So the old standard being Hive, which really relied on the way your files were structured. So essentially you would have like the folder that's your table. And then in the folder, you would have all these subfolders for all your partitions. And while a lot of these newer formats do still sort of rely on organizing the data that way. Apache Iceberg completely decouples that from being necessi necessary. Instead, in the metadata, there's actually just a list of the files that are part of your table. So you could have your files, like by default, your files will be organized in sort of that hive structure, but you can actually turn on like what's called compatibility mode. And this is optimized for like object storage, because if you're using something like S3, you might run into an issue where having all the files for a particular partition in the same directory could end up being throttled because there's only so many requests you can make per second to the same prefix or the same directory in, in an S3 bucket. Um, so that runs in. So basically, if you really are tied to that hive structure, that that'll well, it'll be a bottleneck. Uh, Apache Iceberg, by decoupling from that format, really allows it to be scalable on on things like S3 or any object storage which is huge because that's pretty much where a lot of data lake house, data lake type storage is going towards. A lot of people are migrating to object storage because it's, it's more affordable, it's easier, gives you really like tight uh, security controls. Um, so that's yeah. pretty exciting. But on top of that, it has like a three tier metadata structure, which is really nice because what happens is that you'll have like this global metadata file, then you have like this snapshot level metadata file. And at that point, the query engine can begin eliminating big chunks of the potential files to scan. Um, and then it, what it does, it can do a granular file by file like pruning. So when you get to that third level, which is like these groups of files, I can look at each file, analyze sort of like the like the upper and lower bounds of each column in the data, and begin eliminating files I don't need to scan. So you're really just scanning like the, the narrowest number of files you need to scan for. So you get a much quicker plan, a much quicker scan. So you're getting a much faster query and a much more affordable query because again, if I can reduce the time of the query without having to increase the compute power, I've just saved money. Yeah. I Yeah, between things like S3 and uh, Azure Data Lake Storage, those object stores that you mentioned, and then mm -hmm. these table formats like Iceberg, Hootie, and Delta, they've really been a savior for the data lake approach, right? This idea that if you have, uh, if you kind of miss the the role of a database and some of those that transactional aspects of it. How could I ever, you know, do I have to handle all that myself in a data lake? Well, these are the tools that will help you help you get that done. Right? So yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Like they're yeah. absolutely fascinating. Um, and then the, every day they, they go closer to the closer to like, you know, like feature parity. So like a lot of them had like fairly 
different features, but I say definitely over the last like three, four months, as far as like things like schema evolution and, and things like Z order, a lot of them are more converging to have like a much more feature parity. Um, and then the, so basically, and then that makes it kind of hard like to compare. Cause like a lot of people, when they want to compare these formats, they think of two things. They think of performance and they think of features. Eventually all of these are going to have the same features. Performance, the thing about performance is that each of these formats are providing you sort of the standard way for an, any engine to interact with that data. So the performance is going to differ quite a bit from engine to engine. So you always see the performance based on like, oh, how did it do in Spark? But what if you're not using Spark? What if you're using like a Dremio or a Trino or some other tool? The performance between the different formats will be different. So that's why. And then again, that will always generally improve over time too, because there's improvements that happen at the actual cable format level and then at improvements that happen at the engine level, uh, along with just the settings that you particularly set up, which some of these like performance benchmarks that I've seen so far, they don't really document too much about like their actual individual cable settings to really kind of gauge like sort of how they, they did their comparison. So that's why I get, I always come back to when it comes to comparison, like uh, I focus on the openness because that's the one thing that's sort of like not necessarily always going to get back to parity. Um, and one thing that, 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 that can be a, a, a real persistent factor in the long run. Yeah. Agreed. All right, let's move on to, um, this one I'm dying to talk about. This is uh, something that I know very little about. Is that Project Nessie? Uh, what is its role in the in the data lake house? Project Nessie. I, I just find this personally exciting. So also having uh, done work as a web developer and spending a lot of time with like Git, I, I just find versioning to be an exciting topic. And that's what Project Nessie does. It, it brings uh, versioning to your data. But it does. People have heard of other projects like like LakeFS, and it takes a slightly different approach. So where something like a LakeFS does your versioning at, at the cloud storage file level, diffing between the files on your storage. What Nessie does, it does diffing at the catalog level. So essentially what it does, it acts as like your, particularly for Apache iceberg tables. So really like if you want to get the value of Project Nessie, like Apache iceberg is the way to go in this case. But um, with Project Nessie, it takes your catalog and, can tra and you can branch and have branches of your catalog. So essentially you're capturing the differences in your metadata which means the amount of different objects that it has to track are going to be a lot less, so it can handle a lot much higher throughput. So if you're talking about like really high frequency streaming, where you're going to have a high, a lot, a lot of changes very frequently, being able to, having to track less objects to get to the same result is going to allow, allow for like sort of better performance at that high acceleration. Um, but what um, Project Nessie does, it essentially gives you those Git-like semantics, uh, but at the table level. So instead of me branch, just creating a branch that just says, okay, hey, I'm going to track all your files differently, instead I'm tracking your, your catalog. Um, and that allows you to have a lot of those Git-like semantics in your SQL, which is really the, one, of the, one of the coolest things. So like right there in my SQL, I could do, do things like create a branch. Okay, let me merge a branch. And so that way I'm not having to switch between like running a JavaScript or a Python script to do all these switching between branches. I can just do it right in my SQL. Um, which allows, makes it more accessible for more people who may not be as comfortable with things like Java or Python uh, and, 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 and more sort of general purpose programming languages. Um, and um, yeah, uh, it works really well with like Apache, uh, particularly with Apache Iceberg. Uh, there is like a special build of Delta Lake you can use it with, um, um, but it's not, it doesn't have like full support for Delta, Delta Lake at the moment. I think there's like okay. a pull request pending on, on the Delta Lake project for, for handling that. Um, but, but right now it does have full support for Apache Iceberg. Um, and essentially what happens is just again, give, give an example. So let's say I'm going to ingest some data. What I can do is if I know I'm going to edit like five tables, so I'm going to ingest data to five tables. Um, and, but those five tables are subject to multiple joins. So the problem is if I update one table out, at a time, what's going to happen is that I'm going to have queries coming in that join those tables and they're going to be getting partially updated data. And that would be bad for my data consumers. So what I can do is I can create a branch, do all my work on my five tables, and during that whole time, all my data consumers are just querying the main branch, which doesn't have any updates yet. So they're not getting any kind of partially updated data. I finish all five tables of work, do all my tests, do whatever I need to do to make sure that it's all good to go. And then I just run a merge, and it basically gets treated as one big multi-table transaction right there in my data lake. And basically all that data goes live at the same time. So there's no concern about you know, hey, there's this weird join that happened because I was halfway done with the job. Um, and that is tremendous. Yeah. Yeah, what a, wow, that's an incredible advantage to have and and um, to do some testing and 
and development as well uh, in regarding your lake house. Now, what is required to run Project Nessie? Say if I wanted to do it, what am I looking at? Um, it's basically just you just have to run a service. So they do have like Nessie uh, in a Docker container that you can just kind of run and then basically um, it just acts as like the service that you just make different uh, REST requests to. Although there are libraries that just handle that connection. So if you're using Spark, you would just basically set your iceberg settings when you're setting up Spark. And it would, there's actually like a Nessie implementation. So it would just be a, changing a few settings although you know having to set up your own service and maintain it can be kind of annoying and that's where kind of like uh dremio has a service that that's currently in preview um uh in, will be ga hopefully by by end of the year um called uh, uh dremio arctic and basically what it is it's a hosted nessie so that way you, literally all you have to do is okay. sign up and manage nothing and it's like right now there, there's no cost like it just runs um <clears throat> So it's basically a, a, a free Nessie server. Um, and so then basically it also... Oh, Go ahead. Oh, uh, it, it would... Yeah, it actually technically... It would, I think the server itself, I think, is like hosted in uh, the, by Dremio, but then your all the data is stored on your AWS S3. Gotcha. And, but, but the there benefits, is a self-hosted op option with like a Docker. That would, that you correct. Can then you would have okay, to manage, gotcha. the, manage it yourself, yeah. Um, sure. but so you have those options. So essentially anyone can add it at any level in their mix. They can add it as a Docker container that's just running on, on, uh, their service of choice, um, or they can get a self, a, a, basically a SaaS version of it. Um, but it's basically that option is there. It works really great again with Apache iceberg tables. And, um, one other aspect of that whole multi-table transaction benefit, is like, not only can I merge those transactions from multiple tables, cause you can do that with data warehouses where I can say, okay, let me do these transactions on these tables and then do them all at the same time. But you can actually have it where it's multiple users. So multiple users could be operating on that branch mo across multiple engines. And then you merge all that stuff all as one thing. And that you can't do in a data warehouse. I can't have a bunch of transactions coming in from different engines and different tools and then still merge them in as just sort of one big multi-table transaction. Yeah, generally isolated to, the, to whatever client is trying to perform that operation, right? Yeah, that's... Yep. Uh, uh, to be honest, sounds a little scary, but it also sounds a little powerful <laughs> as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely a, yeah, a different way of thinking about things, right? Yeah, another impressive uh, tech involved in, in the data lake or data lake house uh, realm. Um, now, I, of the things we've talked we talked about, you know, Arrow, Iceberg, I know Project Nessie is also open source, but it's not Apache. Are there any plans to get to be a part of the Apache? I Foundation. don't know specifically what, whether that's part of the roadmap. I mean, I'm sure, like, the Become Apache project, there are sort of, like, um, things you have to sort of, like, meet. So, I mean, I'm sure, um, I would assume that they would want to be eventually. I can't speak for them because I'm, I'm not part of the, the actual, like, committee or the group that, 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 that runs the project to, to know for sure. Um, but I do... I would imagine so. I would I would guess that it, it'll continue to expand as a bigger and bigger community based project. That's okay. Generally, like the people, the people around these projects are generally like the kind of people who appreciate sort of like ex bigger uh, openness. Uh, yeah. So I it's would, on the track. I would, that would be my guess. Yeah, on the track. Yeah. Maybe first stop, it's an incubator, and then it gets to be mm -hmm. a full fledged deal. Well, well, we can hope, right? That's a uh, like I said, it, uh, we're neither one of us are in the driver's seat, but uh, hopefully it becomes part of the Apache uh, Foundation uh, for the reasons we listed during the top of the conversation. So, yeah, but good stuff nonetheless. Um, another one for me to get more familiar with, for sure. Uh, since we've been talking about open data lake house uh, tools a lot in the last part of the conversation, do you have any advice for people wanting to contribute to one of these things we've been discussing, one of these tools? I guess the first step I would do is go fork the repository, go start looking at the code. Um, so you can see like, hey, if you have any really interesting ideas of places you'd like to like contribute, um, you can always just start off by just, you know, and if you have an idea, put an issue on that particular um, repository, in the reposit in the GitHub repository for that particular project. Um, all of them have Slack communities. So like Apache Iceberg has a really robust like a Slack community that, that's constantly responsive. I, all three table formats have pretty robust Slack communities. Uh, Nessie has um, a Slack community. Um, so you can you can reach out to people there. 
Um, and then all th all of their websites both also have like contributing guides on like how you can get started with contributing. Um, but I would first fork the project and start looking at the code and kind of thinking like, where do I see myself contributing in this project? Yeah. Like there's a lot of, a uh, lot of really cool potential features that could be added to any of these. Yeah. I'll also add that I think a lot of these projects, if they're uh, similar to other open source projects I've been involved with, it has been limited, but they generally appreciate um, uh, all features, code fixes, documentation, testing. There's a, you don't have to be an expert coder to be involved in these projects. Um, there's lots of opportunities to help out uh, for a variety of roles. So yeah, check it out. Agreed, and especially on the documentation. Uh, I, I, I can definitely say, um, and for as many open source projects as I've seen, there's always room for more people to contribute to documentation. Um, so yes, so any of you guys who are doc writers want to contribute to open source, yes. There you go. All right, well, hey, Alex, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and talking about the Open Data Lake House. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, it's been fantastic. So for anyone who's listening, Feel free to follow me on Twitter at AM Data Lake House, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'll see you all around. Yeah, I'll have uh, some links, some of the things we've talked about, uh, Alex's Twitter handle, his blog, and he also has a podcast too, The Data Nation. Check it out. I'm a fan. I subscribe. Uh, he's promoting a lot of good content out there, and it's most appreciated by myself and, uh, and the rest of the community. So oh, thank, uh, you. thank you, listeners. Thank you, viewers. Until the next time, talk to you later.